Hi, and welcome to the Seek Sustainable Japan podcast. I'm JJ Walsh, your host. In this episode, I had the chance to talk with the wonderful Aya Kawakami Murray, who is very passionate about the performance arts for most of her life. And she teaches performing arts skills, acting skills to her university students. And she started Theater Iridescence. Iridescence, a lustrous rainbow like play or color. In the name,、uh, they reflect the goals to bring to life a wider range of stories told from broader perspectives. So, the work that she's doing there in Nagoya has great effect on a more inclusive and diverse view of how we want to live our lives. This was a great discussion with Aya, and it really reminded me of how the arts are so important.、Uh, creativity, having that diverse point of view, really is so important for a happier and more sustainable society. So, today we're talking about the performing arts. And Aya, you're the first guest that I've had on to talk about this topic.、Um, but you're an educator, you're a performance artist, you're a director, you're an actor. Where did this all, where did this passion for acting start? Can you think back to a time? Yes,、um, definitely. I think it was my time as a child in Singapore. One of the great things about Singapore back then was there was nothing. You know, like it's not the metropolis it is today.、Um, Sentosa, which is now like, you know, full of casinos and things like that, was basically a beach and a broken down outdoor skating rink. So I had a lot of free time.、Um, so I did a lot of after school activities, and one of them was like a song and dance troupe.、Um, but I didn't really think so. Seriously, about that. It was just another fun activity that I was doing, you know.、Uh, but I,、um, I went with one of my best friends to an open cast call for a, a really major musical on,、um, in Singapore with this big theater company. And、um, unfortunately, I got in and she didn't. And it was a bit awkward for a while. But anyway,、uh, that experience was just amazing because I got to see. All the different parts of what theater is and how much goes on behind the scenes. You know, everybody gets to see this one aspect of it, but I got to see the back of it. And that was actually the, the backstage was really exciting for me. And that kind of got me hooked into theater. Yeah. Wow. Now, you grew up in Japan,、uh, very <laughs> bilingual, bicultural Japanese <laughs> and British English, but also American. American. <laughs> you studied in Australia as well. You, you really. And I think your work, you're really trying to integrate so many of the different layers of people、yeah. that we have here in Japan in the kind of work that you're producing and directing, right? Yes, absolutely.、Um, you know, I, I was really, really lucky as a kid to get to, you know, live in these different countries, to have all these multitude of experiences and have this weird hybrid accent as a result, you know, and all this stuff. And I, I really, when I started TI,、um, I really wanted to, to celebrate that by、um, engaging with lots of different types of people from a diverse background. It was selfishly in a way because I wanted to keep that. That continue learning from different people and to keep that kind of、um, international atmosphere in my life.、Um, but also, I think, you know, one of the things I think is really important in, since we are in Japan is to take advantage of the fact that we're here and to really embrace the local artists and the local、um, art, artistic approaches. And that's a really big part of、um, why I started TI. Yeah, absolutely. And we were talking before we started about how important the, the arts are in performing、mm -hmm. art in terms of sustainability and the kind of society we want to live in、uh, that we're striving for. Can you talk on that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things about theater is theater deals in, in,、um, in trying to. Bring out the truth of humanity, of, of you know, the, the beautiful aspects and the, the not so beautiful aspects of human, human existence. And, you know, kind of brings a mirror up for us to, to really examine ourselves and, and to examine situations、um, 
in a partially subjective, partially objective way, right? The advantage is that you're watching something that's happening on stage, so you're once removed, but you're going on a journey with the actors, you know, through the story. And I really find that it's a great place. It's a great space for reflection. And so by participating in theater as a, either as an actor or as an observer, you know, as an audience member, it really allows one to really explore themes from multiple perspectives and maybe gain new ideas and new ways of thinking. I mean, that's one thing that we really wanted to to showcase here in TI is, you know, we wanted to show people a different way of approaching art and also to, to examine different themes. You know, our first piece, Transit, was meant to kind of hold up a mirror to the expat uh, expat community and say, look, you know, these are collections of stories that have I've co collected over the years, you know, um, by being a bit of a fly on the wall, listening to different people. And like, this is, this is our, our, our culture and this is our life, you know, and getting people to examine what that was. I mean, some people didn't really like what they saw, but I'm like, well, it's based on truth. Nothing that has, that was ever represented in that um, show was not something that people had said multitude of times and heard people saying over and over again in different ways. So I think that's one thing too. And by, you know, casting a diverse range of people in and reimagining old stories like what we did with Medea, uh, where we said it in Japan, it allowed people to examine, you know, what it's like to be a foreign woman in, a, in Japan, for example. And I thought that those kind of opportunities are really important that local, you know, people, local Japanese people too could examine and understand how, what people who are maybe Western women might feel living in Japan, for example, you know, the, the good, the amazing and the hardships. Yeah. So in, in that sense, I think uh, theater can be a good medium for reflection. Yeah. Wonderful. I'd like to go back and talk a sure. little bit more about each of those, those plays that you mentioned there. Um, but yeah. before we just say why you wanted to start your own theater company in the first place, <laughs> I heard a great yeah. interview that you did mm -hmm. uh, just mm -hmm. released a few days ago um, yeah. <laughs> by Japan Passion Project. It was a great interview and you were talking about how uh, it was kind of limiting in terms of the mm. producers or um, mm. led by men or kind of, you know, like you, you realized there was a perspective there that you had an opportunity to represent. Is that right? Yes, I, I guess. I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I do know that like in the past and even when I was starting to consider creating TI, you know, there were, there were a lot of great female artists and, and directors and, you know, people who were um, trying to start theater companies and things like that. But I did feel that, yes, primarily like the big theater companies that are international in Nagoya were predominantly run by white men. And I, and that's not a, again, I, I don't mean this to be like a disparaging of those companies. That's not the, the, the case. It was just that I felt like there could be another perspective. And I felt like also the fact that I was half Japanese and was, um, uh, you know, and, and very much raised to be uh, like both of, of both cultures. Um, I felt that I could bring something interesting to the table um, for sure. Um yeah, and I think I was just really lucky that I happened to be surrounded by some incredibly talented women who were kind of itching to really get their voices heard and to be to be represented. Um, and luckily, because of those women, I was able to start this theater company. You know, it is mine, but it isn't. It wasn't built by me alone. It was built by a really amazing group of incredibly talented women. That's amazing. Uh, just to shout out to Louise mm -hmm. and Cheryl who are joining from YouTube. Great to see you here. Uh, Louise says, hello, she's in our time zone. Fantastic. Great to have you here, Louise. <laughs> and Cheryl, I've often wondered about cultural distress and how individuals' perspective would change interpersonally and inter, inter, intra and interpersonally. Wow, mm -hmm. great. Thanks, Cheryl. Yeah. Thank you. 
And hello, Louise. <laughs> Um, so I was showing your logo here. Tell us a yeah. little bit about the name. I love the logo. It's so beautiful. Um, oh, yes. Did you design that yourself? No, no, I did not design that myself. Um, it was designed by a very good friend of mine. Again, a wonderful, amazing female artist. Um, and the name theater iridescence. Well, iridescence is of course, uh, light reflecting upon water. It's like the idea of like the rainbow, you know, multicolors. But of course, uh, one other way of reading iridescence in Japanese would be Aya. <laughs> so it's kind of a play, very subtle play on my name. My name is not actually that kanji. It's the, uh, it's a different kanji. Uh, but I was like, oh, it's a little, you know, little like, undercover little, you know, um, connection to myself but but primarily the idea was that it would be a reflection of um the beautiful diverse cultures in japan yeah that's fantastic and your tagline mm -hmm. story uh, shining untold. a light on untold stories yeah mm -hmm. yeah so that's you're I mean, trying to now some of the plays that you've actually written yourself uh, do they come from your personal experience or just things you've observed and kind of creatively you thought of? Or where does that come from? Um, so I've I've only written one um, play and the rest are all adaptations of, of other plays um, or a reimagining of a classic play. Um, but Transit was somewhat somewhat based on my life there's of course you know one pulls from one's own life certain aspects and I did use a couple of story lines from my own life but I think that a lot of people thought it really literally was about my life and it was about the way I felt about things and it wasn't it was a collection of stories it was years of research of talking to different people about their life experiences here you know, and again, like I said earlier, it's kind of like being a fly on the wall at the bars, at the restaurants, hearing what people were saying, you know, and a lot of times, especially when people are drinking, they're not really paying attention to someone sitting in the corner kind of with their ear picked up a little bit, you know, so it was a, a combination of all of those things. And I think one of the things that I really, I think ultimately felt like I hadn't made clear enough was that it really wasn't about me. And it wasn't really a story about me. Um, it didn't help that I played the main character, of course. Uh, there was a couple of things that I would definitely do differently. Um, and yeah, the main character being half Japanese, me being half Japanese, you know, you know. But yeah, that one was definitely a a collection of different people's stories. With Medea, it was, you know, a, tr a traditional Greek play that was just basically set, reset in Japan and certain things were changed, like the names of characters was changed, but the essential story was exactly the same. It was just that by setting it in Japan um, and by having Medea, which Medea actually in the original Greek tragedy is a foreign woman from a foreign land, but by setting it in Japan and having um, Jessica, my wonderful friend and wonderful actress, play Medea, it just kind of helped to frame the story from the perspective of, you know, Western women living in Japan. And, you know, Medea loses her husband to um, the, lo you know, to a, a local woman, right? So he, the, the husband goes and marries a Japanese princess in the story, uh, the reimagining. And I mean, this is something that does often happen in Japan. And it's, you know, and that kind of feeling of, uh, the invisibleness of being a Western woman sometimes, you know, um, I think was a really important theme that I wanted to bring out when I thought of the story of Medea. I really thought, uh, I think we could tell the story from the perspective of, you know, a lot of how some Western women feel when they come to Japan. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. And the, one of the things you were saying in the interview was that um, you had <laughs> the dialogue was mm -hmm. really tricky because you wanted the actors to speak in Edo era Japanese. Oh. That is right. That is correct. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was an insane idea. The show itself was just a crazy idea. Um, it was a huge gamble. I didn't think it was going to necessarily work, but thank goodness we had a really dedicated um, actress who's Japanese was quite good anyway and she worked so hard on this uh show i really you know 
I can't imagine having to do all that in a foreign language and especially like period Japanese. But what I really loved about that, uh, as I mentioned in, in the previous podcast that I did with, um, um, oh my goodness, Passion Project, um, was, you know, the, the real collaboration, the real helping of each other, you know, they would help each other with their lines. If there were English lines, you know, the English actors would help the Japanese actors with the English lines, with the Japanese lines. The, there was an amazing actress who was um, playing the princess who Medea's um, husband leaves Medea for, but the actresses were working really closely with each other and helping each other out. Um, we had um, Nishikawa san, the head of the, the Iemoto for the um, House of Nishikawa's uh, School of Dance, come in and teach us movement. And, you know, the Japanese actors after that kept helping the, the Western actors with those movements. And it was just, yeah, it was a beautiful collaboration. But yes, they had to speak in Edo period Japanese for a lot of the scenes, because a lot of the scenes had to be in Japanese. It didn't make sense otherwise, right? Why would an Edo period lord speak in English it just wouldn't make sense so yeah we limited the English only to as you do in an international you know uh, relationship to when they were in the house together just the husband and the wife were in the house together or ex-husband and wife yeah wow and you have yeah. both Japanese and international actors that you're you're yes. a di director uh role in your bilingual uh, is pretty much everybody in your cast are they functional bilinguals living in no, Japan? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends on the production, of course. Like this, the most current production we have is actually an English cast only this time. Um, it's it's been a quite a long hiatus for me. So uh, coming back, I'm keeping things very, very simple for my first show. My next show will be much more ambitious. Um, but yes, uh, not necessarily did people speak, do people speak the same language? Um, some people speak no Japanese, some people speak no English. And essentially, um, for some productions, it was literally myself translating myself back and forth, you know, um, so I'd be like, uh, okay, let's do it again. Like that would be just in one breath, you know, or mm, let's do it again because the timing wasn't quite right. And that's literally just in one breath would be what I uh, I would do as, a, as, as I was directing bilingual productions. That's amazing. But I'm, but yeah. I'm used to it, I guess. I, I guess I'm used to it. <laughs> That's really cool. Now, with your next production, Speaking in mm -hmm. Tongues, you had a really unique approach. You had uh, entire production in English, entire production in Japanese, and yeah. people would watch in one or the other language. Some of the audience would then stay for the, the version that they didn't watch. Yeah. Is that right? That's amazing. That's right. That's right. So we, we really... So when you have a bilingual production, um, oftentimes you have to use subtitles and we wanted to avoid using subtitles because we wanted to um, sell, be able to have the, act, the, the audience really just watch the show. And as we were thinking about that, um, I, we ended up thinking, well, why not have two productions? Because it's a really interesting opportunity for people to see how two directors, one Japanese, one Western act, uh, director, how they would interpret the exact same piece and um, how a Japanese cast would interpret it, how a, how a Western cast would uh, interpret it, an international cast would interpret it. Um, and they were so different. <laughs> The two shows were so different. It was it was mind like it was amazing in the sense. Um, I remember people coming to me being like, I felt like I watched two completely different shows, and I I have to agree. But um, yeah, by watching it once in your the language that you're more comfortable with, it I felt like it was a really great opportunity to allow people to see not only two perspectives, but to be able to see both shows without being so focused on looking at subtitles. I can't even imagine from an organizational perspective how you would do that. And then it, it must have been really interesting for the audience, but like logistically and uh, for all the rehearsals, it must have been quite an organizational yeah. task. 
<laughs> it it was because in essence we were doing two shows at the exact same time it wasn't you know i think maybe it was me primarily naively thought that oh you know it's it's just one show you know it's not going to be that difficult i mean yeah two casts and you know um the two directors it's not going to be that difficult um and about maybe like a couple weeks in i was like wow i have bitten off way more than i can chew um uh, but you know i was really lucky we had a really great production crew that uh with that production really like uh, amazing people who took on so much in order for that to actually happen um but yes you know twice two directors two egos two approaches two groups of of actors with each you know each group having their own drama and things like that i mean it was just yeah Her herding kittens is what i often feel like we do as you know a production crew but it was like a you know double batch of kittens that we had to herd so that was a that was a challenge but ultimately it was really rewarding i think <laughs> Can you talk about the, you mentioned mm. the process is different for Japanese actors or mm -hmm. uh, Western actors or for non-Japanese yeah. actors. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? How do people usually uh, do acting in Japan versus other places? You talked about like the yeah. in, inside out, outside in kind of yes. idea. Yes. Yeah. So, um, this is not only based on on my own observation, but what people I, I you know I've talked to a lot of my Japanese actor friends, and they they often talk about the fact that you know you katakara hide, which is uh, kata meaning like your body language, how you move, how your face moves, you know, um, and starting with that, like making sure that you look right for that emotion or you look right for what's happening in the scene um so it, it's 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 more about paying attention to how you are perceived by the audience and trying to make it um acceptable in that way and this is really f interesting because i talked to a choreographer a japanese choreographer about japanese dancers and i i had commented to her like i always feel like japanese dancers don't really emote with their face and and she's like well no we we, we focus on the body you know the the face is, is is secondary you know the emotion in there is secondary if you cannot focus on creating the emotion for the audience you know um, you feeling it means nothing. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, and I, I, I do think that there is something to be said for that because I think sometimes, you know, um, I have Western actors who are like, I really felt it that time. And I'm like, I didn't see it though. I felt it. I, I understand that you felt it, but I didn't, it didn't come across to me, the audience member. And so there is something to be said for paying attention to the kata, of course. Um, but uh, I think from a, a Western perspective, we start with like text analysis and in-depth character analysis and character motivations. And, you know, what does that character want to do in this moment? Um, how are they feeling? What is the history behind this feeling? You know, so we do come from that internal and building an, a character from within. Um, and so sometimes those two approaches can clash. I I remember uh, when I was doing Medea and I had spoken to a Japanese actor and you know had gone on about like what is the internal you know motivation of your character and he got very frustrated and wanted to have coffee with me afterwards to talk about how this is not how I approach my character you know and. It was a really great learning experience for me <laughs> sitting there, you know, trying to understand where he was coming from and kind of meet him halfway. And I think, you know, ultimately uh, having being able to have both toolboxes is is what would make the, you know, the perfect actor in a sense. So I think learning from each other in that sense is a really important one. But yeah, definitely. Um, I learned a lot about the katakara hairu uh, through my experiences of interacting with Japanese actors. Yeah. That's so cool. Uh, we have a comment from Cheryl. I think this would be fascinating to watch the fusion. Is there an entire show available to watch online? I'm not in Japan. Any chance that people can watch it online? 
Um, this particular, this show that we're doing now, um, because of copyright rules, we are not allowed to stream it. Um, we don't have the streaming rights for it. Um, many years ago, we did do a, um, what is it? We did a, um, crowdfunding and, uh, people who uh, donated to our <laughs> theater company did get an extra perk of being able to watch the entire uh, filmed version of Transit the Musical, and that I do have the rights to. Um, so Cheryl, let's negotiate. Let's have a little chat at some point. <laughs> and I'm, I, if you're interested in seeing a past show of ours, that's uh, definitely one. Um, yeah, let's talk uh, maybe after the podcast. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Well, I, I have put your... Uh, website link. So uh, is it is that a good way to get in touch? Yes, yes. Um, there's a contact us tab in the what on the website. So um, and that goes directly to our, our website, uh, sorry, our email. So yeah, please contact me there. Wonderful. Now you are a full time university educator, you have your EDD <laughs> in drama and education congratulations that was Thank one you. of the reasons for the gap right <laughs> yes that's right that's right yes getting yeah. my edgy was a really big thing yeah and you have said um you mm -hmm. really feel that drama is a great skill for everybody for life can you talk about yes. that a little bit sure absolutely um you know uh, for, for example for for just taking an example from my own life, you know, I was a really shy and very awkward kid, and I'm still a very shy and awkward human being. Um, and acting has, has taught me how to channel that and, and move it into a different space so that I can, you know, function as a member of society and interact with people. It can teach you how to be a better listener, better communicator. Um, it's great for job interviews, you know, um, and just being more present with other people. I think it really teaches you a lot about that. But yeah, I mean, if you're someone who's very nervous and anxious and wants to learn how to present oneself in, you know, and overcome that ner those nerves, uh, acting is a really great way to do it. That's awesome. Now you've, it looks yeah. like you've done some talks and lectures um, for other people as well. I found this uh, one. Yes, yes that's demo. right. Uh, what's, what's happening? Where is that? <laughs> That's uh, at the Aichi Art Center, which is this beautiful theater. Um, and this is just a, um, this was a Q&A session. Um, a, a, a Zemi came, a couple Zemis actually came to our shows and then they participated in a Q&A afterwards. Um, but I also have done a lot of workshops, um, drama and education workshops at various institutions, including uh, recently one in Hiroshima um, for Jokaku in uh, the high school. Um, I did a drama workshop with them. I think it was a three hour workshop. They were really great. It was great. It was all about um, experiencing what it's like to be an immigrant. Um, yeah, taking them through the journey of being an immigrant, leaving one's home. But yeah, being so there's able, a yeah, being able to to think about uh, mm -hmm. stepping into somebody else's shoes, uh, having empathy yeah. is really yes, a exactly. great way to do that, right? Yeah, absolutely. So drama and education approaches are like, that's one of the, 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 like a lot of research says that, you know, it's really an amazing way to, for people to gain empathy, to gain uh, better critical thinking skills and looking at things from multiple perspectives. And it's one of the reasons why I love uh, doing drama and education, like workshops and interacting with different people. And I teach drama at my own school and also use uh, drama and education approaches there. Uh, particularly, I, I am, my area of expertise is process drama, which is um, experiential drama. It's not drama for performing for other people. And I'm really, really into that on, on the education side of things. That's awesome. Now, I asked you before we started, if you would yes. mind giving us a little example of an exercise yeah. you might do with students or with your actors, sure. is that okay? Yeah, yes, absolutely, okay. So just everyone, just to note, I have a camera here and I have a screen here, so I'm looking back and forth between two. So I'm gonna probably try to look at Joy right here. I'm gonna look at you in the screen. Okay, so, um, this is a uh, technique called the repetition activity. This is a Meisner approach. And the, the goal 
of this is to really listen and be in tune with the other person. A lot of people think that acting is a very like selfish act, but it's actually, um, it really needs to be a very giving act and just being really incredibly present with your partner. So, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by noticing something um, that you're wearing or something in the background, and I'm going to um, say a sentence. What I would like you to do is listen to how I say it and repeat it as closely to the way I say it as possible. And then after you repeat it, I'm going to listen to you, and I'm going to try to repeat it as closely as I can to exactly how you said it. Um, and whatever it is, the, the rule is whatever way the other person says it, you have to try to match it as closely as possible. Okay? Okay. So let's see. Mm. Your shirt is burgundy. 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 <laughs> I think we get the idea. Wow. Right. How, so, how so, often, how long do you go for? Oh, just a couple times. And then we, we build on that and we do different exercises, but this is the foundation. And, you know, it's really hard to do when we're on a computer. It's yeah. much easier for it in real time, but it's, it's just, uh, I just did that with my drama kids this week too. Um, sorry, I called them my students' kids. Uh, and it really does get them to pay attention. I've done this with, with my actors. Um, and yeah, it's, it's just an exercise about being really observant and attentive to the other person. That's so cool. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate <laughs> no worries. It. So it's a great transition into talking about betrayal, which is your yeah. big production this year. You only do one production every year. Uh, you've right. had a little bit of a hiatus. Mm -hmm. Tell us about betrayal. Okay um betrayal oh uh it is a piece by harold pinter he is a um like a noble laureate of uh, literature he is an incredible playwright he is possibly one of the greatest playwrights to ever come out of the uk it's set in the 19 late 1960s to the late 1970s it spans about nine years of of um, time um and it's all about these two best friends and one of them, one of the men's wife. So there's Robert, Jerry, and Emma. Robert and Emma are married. Robert and Jerry are best friends. Jerry and Emma have a seven year affair. Um, and it's all about connection, craving connection, but feeling disconnected from people, that kind of loneliness that one can feel when you're in a relationship that that you where you don't really feel truly connected it's about two men who are you know living through it a, a time where they can't really be honest with each other about how much they love each other really um and it's just yeah it's all about the things that are unsaid that kind of pull people apart and um the story interesting interestingly starts at the end um and then it ends at the beginning of the relationship and it, we just go back in time um, with each scene, kind of. And the audience kind of gets to play detective and try to sort out what happened between these three people, you know. Um, and there's no big secret. I mean, the fact that they have an affair is is mentioned in the first minute, really, of, of the show. So there's no, oh, my God, they had an affair. Like, we already know. And it's just kind of like, w when did this happen? How did it happen? What made these relationships fall apart? Um, and it stars uh, three really amazing actors, all really um, experienced and very, very talented. Um, we've got Cameron, who plays Robert. Um, he's just perfect for that role. Um, and he's quite the sort of the as is the role, you know, the intellectual um, 
heart of our production. Um, we've got Jerry played by Richie, lovely Aussie guy, down to earth, really hardworking, really dedicated, um, who, you know, who's acting, he's been acting for I think over 10 years um, and all of it locally here and in Nagoya. So he is a Nagoya trained, Nagoya raised actor. And then we have the amazing Rachel as Emma. <laughs> Uh, she went to university for drama. She's incredibly talented, um, you know, and she brings so much, um, not only as herself acting, but she brings so much to the production in terms of her wealth of knowledge and her support of the other actors. She's such a giving actor. I just love working with her because she's so, so giving. Yeah. Um, but yep, yeah, it's, it's basically three really great experienced actors putting on a production that is mm, like at the act it's an actor's show it's very challenging because you know um pinter doesn't give us the whole story and we have to kind of fill in the gaps ourselves so um a lot of our rehearsal has been about creating the world of the story and creating the the minute details of the relationship between the three that helps to flesh it out and make these three characters real living you know three-dimensional people yeah that's so interesting and that on your instagram you have some great interviews with the three main actors and yeah. yourself which is great um <laughs> and one of the thing your actors say is that uh, you're helping like bring out so much of the subtext that there's mm -hmm. so much they have to act because it's not said, it's inferred. Yeah. That must be yeah. extra tricky, right? Sure. I think, you know, um, we have to create. So that that that's why we have to create a really concrete a world and life experience for these characters because you know yes could be yes could or could be no it could be i'm angry at you it could be anything um so we have to have made a choice uh, as a, as not only each individual actor has to make the choice but we also have to make the choices together and make sure that the the narrative of these different um characters lives mesh well with each other but yeah i mean subtext is is something that I think a lot of uh, American audiences don't necessarily enjoy. Um, one thing about Pinter is that Pinter hasn't always done very well in America uh, because some people get frustrated and be like, just say what you're thinking, you know. But <laughs> for Japanese audience, I feel like they will get it. They will get it no problem because, you know, Japanese culture is also about all the things that are unsaid. Japanese and British culture is actually, in this regard, very similar. A lot of kukyo yomanai to kenai, uh, you know, like you have to read the 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 ku and so kukyo yomo read between the lines. You have to kind of grasp that. So that's a big part of um, why I another big part of why I thought it'd be interesting to do Pinter in Japan because uh, I just think Japanese audiences will really. Uh, get it we'll really get what they're what they're doing yeah, yeah i could imagine um mm -hmm. the hone tatemai the yes. public face and so, the, so, the real so. feeling i, I imagine yeah. there's some of that in there <laughs> yes absolutely i mean that is exactly i mean you know uh cameron and i were actually talking about that the other day we're like we're so similar like british culture japanese culture so similar you know, and I remember Rachel <laughs> sending me a text being like, why can't these characters just say what they're thinking? <laughs> and I love that. I love that. So, yeah, yeah, it'll be, yeah. I think, really uh, easily understood by Japanese audiences. Well, great. Um, it's, it's something we need to dive into more, right? How to better mm -hmm. understand each other. Uh, yeah. Whether that's reading the room, like you say, yeah. or listening better, right, yeah. or speaking yeah. more clearly. These are all the advantages <laughs> of the creative yes. performing arts, but also the training of it too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Um, my students uh, here at school, you know, after they do a big production, they're, they're like, you know, I finally feel like I know how to how to use my voice and I know how to 
talk to people and I know how to express my emotions. And I think that's, uh, you know, that doesn't, that can't, how do I say that? Like, like I, I'm, I can't be more pleased to hear when they say something like that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, listening to uh, Rachel when she was talking on your Instagram uh, about yeah. why she became an actor, mm -hmm. uh, she said she was interested in everything. So acting yeah. was a good fit. And I thought maybe that's <laughs> similar for a lot of actors, uh, be able to to take on another personality. It's like travel yeah. on the stage, that kind of thing. I love that. Yeah, I think that's one of the beautiful things about about acting is not only do you get to uh, show parts of yourself that you already have, but to explore parts of yourself that you didn't even know were there. And in a sense, that not that what we do sometimes when we travel is to kind of, by going to a new country, discover something new about ourselves ultimately. And I think that's a big part of it too. But also, honestly, you know, um, every person in theater has to have like a million different drawers of abilities. Um, I can't tell you how many new skills I've had to learn through, you know, doing productions. And I think she's similar, right? You know, every time she does a new show, she's got to learn something new. And I think that kind of curiosity is, is a, something that, that are, is common amongst theater folk, both on and behind the scenes. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Yeah. And then uh, something that Richie was saying, uh, he has mm. so much trust for you, uh, <laughs> having worked with you before, and uh, you were helping him see and experience the deeper subtext of the role, which he's learning a lot. So that, that was really exciting. Mm. And that is really nice. Hear when your actors trust you, that must yeah. be something you work on quite a lot as a director, right? Yes, I mean, I, you know, um, the, the director in some ways is, you know, the, the, the conductor of the orchestra is the, the navigator of the ship. If you don't trust that person, you cannot really, um, give yourself to that production in some, in many ways. And so I hope to earn, and I always strive to earn the trust of my actors. Um, and I think, you know, I mean, I've known Richie for so long, you know, and we've, we've shared the stage together so many times and we've been through some really traumatic performances together. So, I mean, you know, we have that bond already as an, as actors, fellow actors, you know, um, but it, it did really uh, make me blush and, and want to cower and hide, but also made me really uh, happy and, you know, a little teary to know that he, he trusts me because that means a lot, you know, and I, yeah, that's all you can ask for is to to be able to earn their trust and have the opportunity to do so. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And it's it's really important as a, a yeah. woman director in Japan yeah. where we have so much gender gap still yeah. after so many years that to to be respected for what you do and what you do well. Yeah. You know, whether you're a man <laughs> or woman or non-binary, yeah. right? Yes, absolutely. And and I have to say, of course, it's a challenge. You know, um, I've had actors be very adversarial towards me, and that's been really difficult. I've had, you know, not really my production crew, because I'm always really lucky with that. Um, but, you know, even when I'm going out and promoting shows or, you know, talking to other people, sometimes, you know, not so interested in, in uh and what I have to say, or what what we are trying to do, you know, a little bit of sometimes, not 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 often, but sometimes that kind of negative thing does happen. And but generally speaking, I think I've been really really lucky um, that I've been able to um, have the people around me that I know will not consider my gender or gen the gender or, or the identity of the other person. Um, let that be. Um, prejudicial in any way yeah I think yeah. that overall we've always had pretty uh at least in TI we've had really a good group of people who've never really been that disparaging I mean I think primarily it's mostly cultural more than gender-based that we've had um any clashes and those clashes just are part for the course of working with people from different backgrounds and what we just do is we sit down and we talk about it and usually just 
solves itself in that way. Yeah. So wow. I've been pretty lucky. <laughs> yeah. No, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and then Cameron was saying uh, for him, it was a real challenge mm -hmm. uh, going back to the ideas of gender, men and women of the <laughs> 1970s, where the play is set. So that, that has so many parallels and hopefully mm -hmm. some feelings of accomplishment that we have moved on in some ways, but yeah. other ways we haven't, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I mean, bless Cameron, he's just such a lovely human being. And, you know, some of the things that these men say, some of the things they do in this show, I mean, I know he couldn't imagine doing them. Um, but what I thought was very interesting about this piece is, you know, it's in set in the late 60s to mid 70s. And it's kind of when women were, you know, starting to, um, gain equality. And, you know, within that, there was a lot of friction, right? Um, a lot of men in that time were not entirely pleased that women wanted to be on equal footing, wanted to get those, get the jobs and, you know, be working and not be cooking and taking care of the kids at home. And that is actually a theme, you know, uh, that I think modern Japan now is still grappling with, you know, the, the you know, I, listening to attitudes on the street, listening to people talking, again, being a fly on the wall, listening to people talking, it's still very much an issue in Japan today. And so I think that there are parallels that people can can kind of connect to, uh, even though it is set in the 19, late 1960s, you know. Yeah, um, there's so many things from the past that mm -hmm. we can learn from, right? Yeah. The, the main thing is not to completely erase the past, uh, yeah. to, to keep moving forward and, and be honest yeah. about our flaws and, mm -hmm. and not repeat our mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I, I think, you know, the, the, um, I, th I think that we can, we can, like, it's kind of like Mad Men, you know, like, you can look at it and be shocked by it, but then go out in the street and be like, oh, well, I mean, it's different, but it's not that different, you know, that kind of connection, yeah, I think is definitely important, and yeah, you know, there's a lot of, like, ignoring of women sometimes, or ignoring of, of, of women's feelings that still does happen and that's a really big theme of the show I'm, I'm we we in the cast have a hashtag that's called hashtag justice for judy and the reason why the, the, the hashtag is there is because um jerry played by richie he has a wife named judy but she never shows up in the show at all and she's also literally mentioned like all the time people are asking him like how's judy and she he's like she's fine She's great. Good. We don't know anything about her. By the end of the show, we still know nothing about Judy. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of like erasure of a, a person's identity also, I think is a, a theme that we can still relate to today. Absolutely. How many, how many of us feel like we're invisible sometimes? And then yeah. how many stories do you hear about people who go through life feeling that way, right? So yeah. Definitely yeah. very relevant. Now you you wear many hats. You are not only the director, you're often the actor and the writer, but you're also the business owner of the theater company. Tell us mm. a little bit about some of the challenges, but also learning mm. that process. Was it hard to get to know how to do that? Uh, yes, yes. I mean, you know, uh, TI is its own, you know, thing, of course, in the sense that it, it it's, um, how do I say, like, I try to keep that as a separate entity from my own other aspects of life. Um, but yes, learning how to, to uh, budget uh, learning how to sell tickets, <laughs> learning how to promote. Like I, I said, I'm, I'm actually a very socially awkward person. Um, and so the first time I had to produce a show and I had to go to like dinners and talk to people I don't know and, and you know, and try to be like, please come and see my show and you want to financially support us because we're amazing, you know, um, inwardly just cringing and just wanting to... Um, 
yeah, just to go into my little like rabbit hole. I remember like there are so many nights after going to some event and being like, oh, chatty, chatty, chatty. I get in the elevator and just be like, oh, I just, I can't do this. I can't do this, you know, and having a panic attack afterwards. Um, so that, that aspect is really challenging, was challenging for me. Um, and, you know, like talking about myself and talking up TI was, it's just not something that I'm really comfortable with. Um, but yeah, the finances, like knowing what things are going to cost. Um, you know, the first time I did a show, uh, it was a very soft open. We didn't actually call it a TI show, um, but I did a show called um, Snow Angel. And it was like a one act play that I did with another theater company that did another one act. We were doing a combination. And I mean, I just had no idea how much things were going to cost me. And that was a... That was not a financially successful show because I didn't know how much things cost. I didn't know how to budget. I didn't know how to say no, you know, um, but I've learned. And now I know, you know, how much percentage of my 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 budget I can spend on this one, X, Y, and Z. And yeah, I'm slowly learning how to say no to certain things. Yeah. For sure. Um, you mentioned about the budgeting and the cost of the theater. There's a lot of costs involved. Uh, one of the ways you could save money is getting all your actors uh, to sell tickets, which is kind of a Jap part of Japanese culture. Can you talk yeah. about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, um, so back in Hiroshima, when I was a uh, part of my opera, um, I was really surprised that when I went for my first rehearsal, they gave me a packet of tickets and they said, this is your ticket Norma. And I was like, what is a Norma? I was like, cause Norma is actually a famous um, opera. So I was like, wait, I'm, I'm in, I'm in a different show. This is not the right show. And they were like, no, 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 Norma means like you have to sell this many tickets. And I'm like, but each ticket, it's like each my And they're like, yep, you gotta sell them. Gotta sell them. I was like, so what? What happens if I don't sell them? Well, then you'll pay for them yourself. Like I have to pay to perform. You know that had ne that had never happened to me before. Um, so yeah, that was my introduction into Japanese arts. And I mean, yeah, I mean that's how these um, big uh, opera companies, for example. So I, I can't necessarily speak for all theater, but the, the Japanese opera company, this was normal practice. You know, all of my like actor dancer friends were like, I have to sell this many tickets, so please buy a ticket from me, you know. So that was interesting. Um, when I came to Nagoya the, and started interacting with Japanese theater companies, um, some of my actor friends told me that, you know, they don't have to necessarily like pay if they didn't sell the tickets, but it would make it difficult for them to get hired again. So their ability to sell tickets was a big reason why they would be hired. Um, and, you know, I think I mentioned in previous podcasts that like one of the actors I once worked with, he was like, so how many tickets do I need to sell? I'm like you do not necessarily have to sell a set number of tickets, uh, but the more you can sell, the better, obviously for us, you know, please sell tickets, but there is no requirement that you have to sell X, Y, Z number of tickets. Um, so yeah, and, and and with TI, we generally try to go with a um, encouraging system as opposed to a, like a muchi, muchi o tataku system. It's more of like a honey uh, system, which is um, whoever sells the most tickets gets like a special present from me. <laughs> that's that's about it and you know and mostly i'm like please sell tickets and i try to work my butt off so that you know my my actors don't have to worry too much about that um yeah because yeah. they're they're doing it for free right it's a is it you're not paying your actors are you um or you they well, do get compensated uh this depends on certain things but i do generally try in some way to compensate my actors, um, nice. whether it's like a percentage or if it's like a, if we didn't do so well in the box office, then a small ore is usually what I try to do. Yeah, that's um, really nice. Because what you were mentioning about the pressure to sell tickets, that's not just mm -hmm. theater. I've heard a lot of musicians yeah. say the same yeah, yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, to yeah. cover the cost of the, the, the venue, right? Usually. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's just because 
pans. So if you're like Gekidan Shiki, or you're like Shiata Obu in Tokyo, and you're like a major big name. So if you're like basically like Broadway class theater company, then, you know, your actors don't have to worry about selling tickets. They're, the tickets are going to sell themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, the cost of putting on a show is incredibly high in Japan versus the the risk of, of not making that return is very high in Japan compared to other places because Japanese people are not naturally theater goers, especially of Western theater. And, you know, you're adding an extra hurdle where you're, when you're like, it's in English, you know, with subtitles. <laughs> I mean, even, even our bilingual productions, you know, have had like both the both international and like Japanese people be like, I don't know if I want to read subtitles. And I, I, I respect that, you know, it's like watching a foreign film, you know, it's not for everyone. And so I get, I get that. So yeah, I mean, that's a big challenge in terms of trying to get ticket sales. Um, so for my for my actors, uh, every production I've done something different. Um, for this production, the, the actors now know that they'll be getting a special gift. Uh, but that was actually something I wasn't going to tell them just yet because I wanted it to be a surprise. But yeah, they'll be getting something, a little a little thank you. Oh, that's you. awesome. Now, you're um, one of the, only a few people that I've talked to from mm -hmm. Nagoya. Tell us what yes. is great about Nagoya. Give us a little pitch. Okay. Nagoya is in the center of Japan, and that is just amazing for so many things you, we are so close to everywhere you know like it's a 40 minute train ride to um kyoto it's an hour to osaka it's 90 minutes to 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 tokyo um it's great um in terms of convenience to lots of other different places in within aichi i mean aichi is just such a beautiful place you know you take a two-hour car ride and you're at this beautiful like surfing coast the water's gorgeous you know um there is a lot of beautiful nature. We're very close to Gifu, so you can drive up and enjoy the beautiful rivers um, and the onsens in Gifu also. So again, central location. Um, it's a very green city. There's a lot of parks. I have a dog and we visit different parks within the month and it's just gorgeous that way. It makes me think of England in that sense. Um, there's a lot of arts here. So for me personally, I love being here because it has a really vibrant arts community. Um, not only like visual arts, but also performing arts, really, really yutaka. You know, like I said before, a good friend of mine uh, is the the Iemoto of uh, the Nishikawa uh, Ryu School of Dance. And there's just so much traditional um, art here as well. Um, so that, yeah, I think it's a very rich culture and it just gets looked over a lot. The history you know, of Nagoya is incredible. Like if you like Japanese history, then you must come to Nagoya. Um, it's the center of many, many major points in Japanese history. Um, but yeah, I don't know why we get looked over. It's a great place to live. Um, I came here by accident and now it's my home. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. Uh, before we started, you also mentioned that you have a deep love of Hiroshima, which was lovely to hear. Yes. That you have a family connection, right? Yes, my grandfather. Um, so my grandfather is a hibakusho, and uh, he set up a clinic, a, a medical clinic in in Hiroshima. And I was actually born just down the street from my uh, grandfather's clinic, and so I spent every summer in Hiroshima, and I lived in Hiroshima for I think uh, about nine years. Met a lot of really amazing people, you know, um, and. Yeah, I mean it's it's really my my hometown, so I love it. I actually, Transit, my musical was set in Hiroshima, so a lot of the uh, foreigner hangout spots like the Shag, Molly Malone's, all those places are actually featured um, in Transit as a little ode to my time there. Yeah. Wow, amazing! I didn't know that. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll have to get together when you come back. Yes, and sir. I am coming to your show. Uh, you. Give us a little run through. Tell us dates and times okay. and how people can buy tickets. Okay. 
Tickets are on sale on our website. You can click, uh, go to our website and then click where it says tickets. And if it's an online ticketing system, but if you are, uh, and it's it's in Japanese, but if you scroll down on the tickets tab, there is a step-by-step -step English explanation and it's really simple. It's just basically like put your name in and things like that. Um, the show is June 7, 8, and 9. June 7th, the show is at 7. June 8th, Saturday is a 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And then June 9th is a 1 o'clock and 5 o'clock. So in total, we have five shows. And it is in Osu, um, which is a great part of Nagoya. If you are coming and you want to spend the day and go somewhere kind of unique, it's like um, an international, like, mm, like Shimokitazawa meets Akihabara kind of place. It's a really funky place. Lots of great restaurants. Amazing um, pizzeria there, too. Great Mexican. Some great Vietnamese food. Like, really great international food there. And our theater is Nanatsudera Kyodo Studio, which is a, used to be an old uh, Ningyo Geki theater, like an old Japanese puppet theater. And uh, yeah, tickets are 2,500 yen, which I think is quite otegoro, like not, not too expensive. Uh, yeah, so please come. <laughs> that's awesome. And the 2,500 yen, that's the advanced sales. Uh, yes. So on the door is going to be 3,000, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So buy it so, advance, folks. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for helping yes, with the course, pitch. Of course. I'm, I'm going to be there. I'm going to. Thank you. I'm blocking you. I'm off my weekend. I'm going to go explore Nagoya. So oh, I haven't been great. there for a while. Fantastic. Well, I'll be sending you like my recommendations list and we'll just, we'll have to have a glass of wine afterwards. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Well, good Thank luck. You, so you said you're only Thank on you. about four hours sleep a night. So best of luck. <laughs> Hope it all goes well. And I will see you in Nagoya. Everybody, yes. please join Thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining and see you there. close and you were smiling i seem to be trying as the sun goes down if this went on forever it might be nice i open my eyes